Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with reference recordings. And today we're talking about Beethoven's Seventh Symphony. Now, reference recordings for the Beethoven symphonies aren't as straightforward as you might think. You know, there are there was the the rarity of Beethoven's Fifth in Carlos Kleiber's recording, where the universe kind of coalesced around that as the reference recording, even though it's not like my favorite, and lots of people have other preferences, but it's very, very good, make no mistake. And so, sure, we could we could use that as a point of reference, as a reference recording, an excellent version by a, you know, conductor who didn't like to conduct, and so that made it all the more special. I mean, there are a whole bunch of reasons. But the others are trickier. And as I, as I mentioned when we talked about the Eroica Symphony, not all the Beethoven symphonies have reference recordings because they're not considered major enough or important enough. Numbers 1, 2, 4, and 8 do not have reference recordings, for example. They're just, they just don't exist. Um, and the others, some of them may be controversial or a little tricky. And the seventh is quite tricky. Um, each is a different case. The seventh is tricky because, first of all, it is in many ways the most virtuosic of all of them from a purely technical point of view. Um, so that matters tremendously. You know, you've got to get an ensemble that can really rip through it and a conductor who really understands what they're ripping through um, and who can maintain the energy and the rhythm without becoming mechanical. I mean, it's really, it's a very difficult piece to interpret. What tempo do you choose for the second movement? Allegretto, I mean, there's all, there are all kinds of issues um, that you encounter with the Seventh Symphony. And that makes finding a single recording to serve as the reference, uh, very, very hard. And it's not that it doesn't exist, but you have to make the argument persuasively, I think. But if you were going to make the argument for Beethoven Seventh, and there is a reference recording, it's still this one, which tells you just how unusual this, this circumstances are with respect to the symphony. This is the Toscanini New York Philharmonic 1936 Beethoven Seventh. Now, why is this a reference recording? We have to really define this, I think, clearly in order to understand. Some people would have no problem. Some people would say, yes, it was always the Beethoven seventh of choice because Toscanini was Toscanini and everything he did was great. All the, but it's not that simple. It's not that simple at all. The fact of the matter is that most historical recordings are not references because they've been superseded in much better sound. Performances that may be different, but which are equally good and which had better sound, better distribution, better promotion, and we're simply more recently in people's memories. It's a generational thing, after all. You know, the people who might have thought that Schnabel's Beethoven sonatas were references are largely dead. Some of you aren't. Some of the non-dead ones mentioned that when we talked about Beethoven sonata cycles, and you tried to make the case because it's so famous, but it's not, that's not what makes a reference recording. Um, you know, because Schnabel is Schnabel. It might be it might be the most transcendental Beethoven ever, but that doesn't make it a reference recording. It makes it the most transcendental Beethoven ever, which is good enough. It ought to be. So in, in this case, and you've got an orchestral work too, recorded in 1936, so the sound is kind of grotty. Uh, I, I want to get the sonic issue out of the way right away because, I mean, in orchestral works, it makes a huge, huge difference. The sound for 1936 is actually very good. And while there are snaps, crackles, and pops, you know, throughout the thing, if you listen to an, an unfiltered, you know, 78 pressing of it, even a good one, uh, you really can hear very well what the orchestra is doing. And you have a good sense of presence of the ensemble in a room with an acoustic. It's really a, a beautifully made recording of its era. And, you know, you have to make some adjustments in, in terms of your expectations, in terms of dynamic range and, and, and noise and whatnot. But otherwise, it's pretty, it's pretty splendid. And this particular version of it, which is on Opus Cura, the Japanese label, is the one I, I prefer. Because, because they don't monkey with the sound. They just have a good set of pressings and they've transferred it honestly to compact disc. And that really makes a big difference. So you can, you can actually hear the orchestra quite well. So I'm, I'm not too concerned about the sonics, but you have to take each case as it comes. There's no way to generalize it. Now, Toscanini's Beethoven Seventh, I mean, it is Toscanini, of course, which means he, and he was a great Beethoven conductor. But this was in a sense, the performance, even beyond the fact that it's Beethoven's Seventh, that used Beethoven's Seventh almost as a vehicle 
to establish modern standards of orchestral performance. And I'm not exaggerating that. It really is an astounding achievement for 1936. If you listen to other Beethoven sevenths of the era by people like Richard Strauss, who recorded it, and others, you know, and people, you know, people who are supposedly fine conductors, they're mostly dreadful. They really are. The orchestras aren't very good. I mean, what you can hear of them, and there's this is this this performance exists on a different level of technical accomplishment. Toscanini and the New York Philharmonic in this work were the Tiger Woods of classical music. They raised the level of expectations and set a new standard using this symphony, which was a perfect choice because it is a symphony with that exists at an amazing level of virtuosity, but because of that wonderful second movement, it's a combination of virtuosity and expressiveness, and it requires interpretive intelligence, and it, all of those qualities come to rest in this single work. And that's what you get in this performance, it really is. And it's a measure of how fine this performance is that it still is spoken of as one of the great Beethoven sevenths, that you can actually talk about it that way and justify it. It's not just, you know, a, a hagiographic view of Toscanini or a, being a cult member of something or a collector of historical recordings. You know, the worse they sound, the more you like them, the greater they must be because, because you are... You are uh, adding in your imagination the things that you can't hear on the actual disc. There's none of that. All of the audible evidence supports this recording as being one of the great Beethoven sevenths. Now, of course, you don't get things like exposition repeats, and there's, you know, it's, it's of its time. It's definitely of its time. But you can hear the remarkable standard of performance. You can hear Toscanini's fabulous grip on the piece as a whole his vision for the work as a whole, his handling of Tempe. The finale, for example, is not the fastest out there. It's not a lickety split finale. It's actually rather measured, but it's rhythmic. And this is a symphony that is about rhythm more than any of the other Beethoven symphonies. You know, it's the apotheosis of the dance, as Wagner stupidly called it, which I disagree with entirely. But it's not the point. The point is, that Toscanini nailed it. And he did it, I remember, in, a, in, in an era when you didn't get to make thousands of takes of things. I mean, when this is the real sound of the orchestra in a real room, not cut and edited and spliced. And beyond the excellence of the performance, there has to be something that's going to keep it in the public eye, keep it in front of us, to continuously acknowledge its greatness over time. I mean, that's one of the things that makes a difference between this and many other historical recordings. This was remastered onto LP um, in the 50s, and, and my mother owned the LP. I had this recording. This was our first Beethoven 7th. It has nothing to do with whether I like it. It's not my favorite Beethoven 7th, by the way. I like many others better. I like Thomas Beecham. He's more fun. I like, I like Gunter Vond. I like a lot of other people doing Beethoven 7th better. So, so that's not the point. The point is that this was there. This The Toscanini New York Phil Beethoven 7th was kept available and in print forever. And so its status um, was constantly being challenged and it was constantly being compared to newer versions and it was constantly being acclaimed as a great recording. And that's what makes a reference recording. You know, it survived the test of time, which is pretty remarkable because it's now almost 100 years old. Think about that. And it's still one of the great Beethoven sevenths. It's still a reference that you can use to get a sense of what the music is, what it expresses, how it expresses it, and you can compare it to other versions, most of which will be inferior, which is really kind of amazing. I, I, it's, it's, it is an astonishing testament to the artistry of Toscanini, to his gift as an orchestra builder, um, to his intelligence as a Beethoven interpreter, and to the durability of great music making, provided you can hear it. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care.